G'day, g'day. Welcome again to GPSA's next uh, webinar. Great to have you here again. We've got Nick, uh, Nicole Higgins with us, who is a GP supervisor and educator from Mackay. So great to have you on board, Nick. Welcome. And Nick is going to be presenting Thank you, Thinking Outside the Box, Developing and Delivering Teaching That Connects. So I'm not, uh, we're, for those of you that are aware, we've uh, just started our our uh, GPSA YouTube channel and of course what that does is it gives you always a great opportunity to listen to yourself and I've realised that actually I talk way too much so we're going to move very quickly through uh, my section. I just need to give you a little bit of housekeeping. Obviously like always we uh, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet, people from all around the country so thank you very much and uh, pay respects to their elders past, present and their families. Now, if you haven't been to a GPSA webinar before, uh, you'll notice that you can't speak to the other participants, uh, and uh, but you can put in uh, comments in the chat box. That's how you, in fact, ask a question and how you can converse with uh, both the moderators and the uh, presenter. As you can imagine, with 169 people registered for tonight, uh, that could become a little bit unruly, and so hence why we've got you muted uh, for the background noise. We are re recording the webinar for those that couldn't make it tonight, and uh, we'll be getting that out next week, normally within about five business days after the recording. So without any further ado, I'm going to let Nicole introduce herself and uh, kick it off. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'll tell you what, we had a few, um, a few tech issues before we started, so my heart rate is going up considerably. But if I was at home at the moment, I would be sitting in my dressing gown. I'd be having a glass of wine. It's actually water. Um, so I hope that you're all relaxed and ready to go. And while a few of the stragglers are coming on board, there's something that I actually wanted to play to you. And I think we all know what this is. This is from Dead Poet Society. And this, this shows uh, Robin Williams as a fabulously disruptive teacher, uh, a teacher who actually inspired uh, his students to be the best they could be. So carpe diem. Scottish poetry. That page has been ripped out, sir. Oh, well, or somebody else. They're all ripped out, sir. <laughs> what do you mean they're all ripped out? Sir, we... Never mind. Read. Understanding Poetry by Dr. J. Evans Pritchard, Ph.D. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully has the objective of the poem been rendered? And two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. If the poem score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph... Mr. Keating, they made everybody right, sign it. Mr. you got to believe me, it's true. I do believe you, Tom. Leave, Mr. Keating. But it wasn't his fault. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. One more outburst from you or anyone else, and you're out of this school. Leave, Mr. Keating. Leave, Mr. Keating. I'm sick. What is poetry? There's no street I warn you. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. All of you. I want you to see him. Sit down. Leave, Mr. Keating. I 
<laughs> so now, uh, thanks very much for coming, guys. That was as much as uh, Nicole could uh, uh, put together for us tonight. I hope you've all uh, got shivers, as some of you had down the uh, chat box there. No, really, Nicole is going to be uh, resetting her uh, vision, so she will be back with us in just a second. She's hey, Nicole, back. How are you going? <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, there's not like a little bit of technology to get your heart racing and oh, tech failures. But isn't it, isn't that just a wonderful example of absolute disruption, of turning everything that we know on its head? So anyway, after that Absolutely. lovely start, my name is Nicole Higgins. Um, I am a supervisor from Mackay in North Queensland. Uh, I also work as a medical educator uh, for RVTS and previously with TMT with Conrad looking after supervisors. And my passion and my fun is exploring foam using social media. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful knowledge space. Um, I'm actually probably my most important role. Thank you, Steve. It is a wicked effort. Um, is that I have three primary school age children, and this is probably more what my life looks like. And I'm sure a few of you can probably appreciate this. And hello, Marissa. Welcome. Do you have a crazy, life, crazy busy life like the rest of us? So I actually don't have time to prepare for teaching. So I forgot that I still have my dressing gown on. There we go, we're back. So that's my other job, um, is with GPDU. Now, I don't have time to do lots and lots of paperwork or preparation. I'm very, very lazy. Uh, so tonight what we're going to talk about are different ways that you can think about teaching. Things that will make your life easier, make your workload lighter. And uh, Patrick, hello. Yes, I am very disruptive. Um, dis we'll talk about what the concept of disruption means. And it's something that has been used in education, uh, whether it be primary, secondary or tertiary for a while. But it's just about doing things a little bit differently. We're going to discuss how to flip a teaching session. And then while we're flipping a teaching session, how we can actually dabble in technology and uh, use, it, use technology to make your teaching fun. At, at the end and, and during this, we'll actually incorporate how some of the GPSA teaching guides um, can help you flip your teaching, so how they can make things a bit easier. So before we go any further, I want you to reflect on why you teach and I'd love you to put your comments in the chat box below because I think what you'll find is that we actually all have a very common um, purpose in our teaching. I was just looking at your comments, Steve. I, I can actually, um, if you've got any concerns, I can actually hear things reasonably clearly at the moment. So we, we teach so that we can learn, absolutely. We, you'll actually find that, as I said, it's a common purpose. And these are the reasons that we teach. We teach because uh, it makes our work interesting. It's fun, professional satisfaction. There's a professional responsibility. It's something that we feel that we should do. And Kevin, yep, returning the favour to our teachers. So it's about passing on the baton and that whole ethos of learning. You know, we've all had some really inspiring teachers over time. For me, it's um, I have a lot of fun with teaching. Teaching break up breaks up my working day because you know seeing patients all day can get a little bit tedious. So teaching um, provides a bit of inspiration in there. It's a really good way of staying up to date and I'd actually say to you as supervisors uh, that you actually become learners in this role and ideally as we'll discuss later on you should probably learn more than you actually teach which is introducing that once again that concept of flip teaching. Some people do it because of recruitment and succession planning um, but ultimately we do it because we enjoy it. When we're thinking about 
not only why we teach, we need to think about what we're teaching for. And that's our teaching journey. And what, what do we want our registrars to be? What knowledge do we want to impart to them? Uh, what wisdom? So it's really important that we have our registrars to know lots of stuff. You know, they've got to pass their exams, they've got to get their fellowship. So we want them to have a deep understanding of medicine. Um, importantly, yes, Maggie, we do want them to enjoy general practice. And I actually haven't written it in there, is it? We want our registrars to have fun with medicine. Uh, clinical reasoning. Uh, that is, uh, you know, why is this patient presenting at this time? Is there anything else that it could be? Is there anything that I've missed? Are there any red flags? And how to safety net ourselves? And that's clinical reasoning. This is the part that I really, really enjoy, and that is how to make our registrars complex and creative thinkers. How do we get them to become active explorers in our, our new knowledge economy? And by doing this, we want them to be reflective and self-directed learners as they actively participate. And by doing that, um, you know, it'll be a fun journey. They'll develop good communication skills. And ultimately, they will be confident and resilient uh, GPs. So thinking about your last teaching session, I thought this is a really good opportunity to share some of your teaching. Um, because we all do things a little bit differently. Uh, some days I do it well. Some days I do it really badly. Uh, some days I'm rushed. Uh, some days I'm frustrated. And often I'm unprepared. So I don't like that feeling. So just a little poll that we're just going to pop up. Who did the most teaching, or who did the most work preparing for your last teaching session? Was it you or your registrar? Um, I can tell you what my answer is. Um, yeah, me, 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 me. I'm just having a look at the text box going through and it's nearly all this, a lot of the time it's actually the supervisor who actually did most of the work. Who did the most talking during your last teaching session? Was it you or was it your registrar? So it's about 60-40. And tonight, I guess I'm probably doing the complete opposite of how I, how I usually teach because I'm doing all the talking. But that's just because the group's really unmanageable, you know, in such a large size. So thinking about that, at this stage, most of you have done most of the work before the session. Most of you have done the work during the session. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. And, and thinking about that, you know, did it go well? Um, you know, what did you, what did you prepare? And then thinking back, you know, what could you have done differently? Um, could you have got your registrar to do all the preparation? Could you have got your registrar um, to do most of the talking? So your role just becomes um, a facilitator. So moving on from there, who actually learnt the most in their last, last teaching session? Was it you or re your registrar? So Marissa's just going to pop a poll up. Sorry guys, I'm on Glenn's computer which is a little bit different to mine, which is why I'm having a couple of dramas here. Oh, it's been one of those nights. Actually, there we go. <laughs> I can do it for you. So who learnt the most? Was it you or your registrar? Thanks, Nicole. Oh, Marissa, you missed all the fun before it all started. It was, it was great fun. Okay, so once again, that's about 30, you know, 25% was you. Mm. You know, 75% your registrar. Um, we're going to think about, as I said, things a little bit differently. Where did you teach in the last, last, last teaching session? You know, did you do it in your room? Um, did you do it in your registrar's room? Did you do it somewhere else?
So my, my favourite thing um, is usually going out of the practice or out of my room because I spend a lot of time in my room. And, and as you can see from this most, of this, most of the teaching has been done in your room, so in the supervisor's room. So there's already a power imbalance then. And there are different types of teaching that you can do in different teaching spaces. Um, the registrar's room might be really useful um, if it's something you want the registrar to reflect on or something that might be personal. Practice tea room is often interrupted. Um, other rooms if you've got other learners. Cafes are fabulous. Um, if you um, want to um, have an informal type of discussion, you probably do most things there, but being mindful uh, that it's not always private. And my favourite is walk and talk. I love going for a walk with my registrar either down by the river or we've got a path by the way, especially if you're talking about mental health things. So teaching can take place in lots and lots of different spaces. Okay, so teaching disruptively. Actually, I like Genevieve's suggestion. Genevieve just suggested going to the pub. Okay, have I frozen again? No, I can still think. No, you good. Okay. Um, yeah, going to the pub, that would be a great one. Um, I've gone to the bottle shop with my registrar. So teaching disruptively. Teaching disruptively just means doing something different from the norm. So this is Che Guevara. Uh, I don't know if m most of you probably already know this, but he was actually a doctor himself and obviously a revolutionary. But the way that uh, Che, especially in his later life, he, he looked at life through a moral lens. So when he wanted to make change, it wasn't doing it for material goods um, but for the right reasons. Now, for all of his badness, and he did do some awful things, uh, you know, this is where some of the foam ethos comes from about free, open sharing um, with our colleagues. So disrupt, if you think of, um, it's just interrupting the normal course. So it's not about jumping up and down naked. Um, oh, some of us have done that before. Uh, during various sessions. It's not about taking your clothes off or throwing chocolates. Uh, it is literally just about doing something different. And, and Maggie, that's actually a really good suggestion. I've had a registrar as well who's come back to work, work with a small baby. So we, did a, we actually did three hours of teaching. We would do it at her house. So there's lots of ways of doing things and being really flexible. And yes, Conrad, I do like chocolate. You know me well. So, Patrick, in answer to you about what um, disruptive teaching is, it's just teaching in a different way. It's no longer um, just what we were taught or how, how we learnt, um, but it's about how we teach, it's where we teach, it's the technologies that we use and the resources that we use. And we've got so many things at our disposal and we've got so many things and places and spaces for our registrars to learn. For me, um, what I, how I associate disruptive teaching um, is about challenging the traditional ways we've done stuff. So teaching do uh, challenging dogma or the word for that now, like everything, it's called dogmalysis. So breaking down um, the traditional model that we have where the registrar is the learner and the supervisor is the teacher. So that now becomes those terms of flattened hierarchy where we're all learners and we're all, we're all teachers. So we're trying to get away from didactic teaching and, for, and we'll go through the reasons why shortly. So it's about getting your registrar to explore knowledge and getting, getting your registrar to bring the knowledge back to you. So we're trying to stop the endless PowerPoints like this one and about me as a supervisor waffling in a monotone, hopefully not in a monotone, um, but this isn't how you would teach face-to-face -face or one-on-one. -on -one. So thinking about what your role as a supervisor is, 
it's to facilitate the learning. Uh, you're not to do all the work. You're not to do all the teaching, um, unless you really want to. Um, but by doing all the work, we don't have time as supervisors. Our time uh, is taken already by seeing patients, our clinical load, all the other things that we do in our family lives. Um, devoting hours per week to teaching your registrars uh, doesn't have to be done. As I said before, a good supervisor will actually learn learn just as much, if not more, than their registrar. I just wanted to share this with you. Uh, I actually know the registrar who posted this, and uh, he decided that he really wanted to be anonymous. Uh, and it actually shows why we need to reflect or think about how we teach. So I'm just going to read this out to you. I'm sure you're already reading it. So there's been a paucity of feedback from my supervisors in this regard. They feel that they have to have had to give the knowledge, but what I need is feedback on how I'm thinking and approaching. I've tried, oh, I've made a typo, so hard to lead, but I'm trying to get my supervisors to do random case analysis. By bringing back patients where I've started to work up, but want to think through my approach, and it always turns into a lecture. I have my thoughts on this based on my search of literature, but this has turned into a wall of text. Bottom line, more honest feedback in terms of clinical reasoning, less lecturing. Um, so this was posted on uh, GPDU or GPs Down Under, which, there we go, there's my, my shirt. Um, so GPs Down Under is, um, we'll go into it a little bit later, but um, it's one of my passions and my babies and it's a space where we discuss and learn knowledge. So thinking as we move into these, into the next part, um, adult learning principles. We're not teaching children. We're teaching adults, and it's and this is about um, not just about registrar-centered teaching. It's also it is supervisors as well. Um, but we really need to think what our registrars want um, and how we can best deliver it that. And, and it's not by just telling them. So some of the theories, and I apologise, I will use the Australian version, but uh, the American ver versions are pedagogy. Um, so pedagogy is just about learning. That's it. Andragogy is adult learning. Tutagogy is the study of self-determined learning. So that's what we're trying to encourage. Um, self-directed learning. And metacognition is learning about learning or knowing about knowing. So you will have seen some of these uh, terms bandied about, but that's all they mean. And yes, some, some registrars, Jen, looking at the textbook, do act uh, like children and sometimes I think some of us as supervisors do too. So how do we disrupt? So we're going to talk about um, flip teaching and and how to flip. And it's a really, really simple, simple thing. So having a look, the, the purpose of this visual is just so that you can see that fl the flipped uh, teaching slide uh, looks much simpler. It's not as busy, it's not as clogged. The traditional slide on the right um, has a lot more steps involved. Um, it's much more complicated. And it is literally about where the registrar goes out to acquire the knowledge. It's not our job to do that. The registrar acquires the knowledge um, by reading, by listening, um, by doing that. And then what happens is you use that time um, when they're with you to facilitate learning. So what then happens is that, I don't know if you've ever heard the, we go from being the guide on, you know, the sage on the stage, which means us as, as supervisors talking um, to the guide on the side. So we facilitate it, the registrar's learning. So there's lots of advantages to using flipped teaching in a lot of um, primary schools um, and um, secondary schools and universities have been doing this now for a few years. So it's not new, but it's relatively new to medical education. So the idea with this is it shifts the responsibility. So your registrar uh, 
is the learner. It is not the supervisor doing all the work. I sound like a, a, a broken record. Uh, I think the beautiful thing that I really get out of flip teaching is that it involves collaboration. It involves you and your registrar working um, as partners um, to get the best outcome. It is similar to PBL in medical school, um, Simone. So it's very simple. Similar to that, it's just shortening it. Um, the other, the other thing that I think is really important as supervisors, because we don't have a lot of time, it makes teaching much, much more efficient. So if you're trying to teach a complex skill or a complex um, clinical question, uh, say, let's use even use hypertension for example, you you send your registrar out to read whatever the current guidelines are to bring them back to you, um, to share their knowledge that they've found with you, and your role. During the, consult, uh, during the teaching session uh, is to actually go through using random case analysis or discussion to pick out the issues that we need to. So PBLs, uh, Jill, is problem-based learning. So a lot of our universities now um, will give a, a question or a clinical question um, to a student or a group of students that they go and work on um, at home and then bring it back. So the registrar changes from being a passive listener um, to an active learner. So they don't simply sit there in a lecture. And I was a dreadful student. Jill, I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm not young either. And I used to sit in the back of lecture theatres. And I, I used to snooze for the first few hours. And there's probably a couple of people on there who could attest to this. Um, I just didn't cope very well with lectures. It wasn't my learning style. Um, Flip teaching works well if you've got an area of weakness. So if your registrar, which I'll use the example in a minute, um, comes to you with, say, depression that they don't know much about, uh, it's a really easy way of getting them to learn very quickly and efficiently um, on areas that they don't know well. Um, Knowledge-based questions. And this really complements um, some of the techniques that we use, um, such as random case analysis, which um, we've gone through before with Simon and Jared, and, and I hope uh, that you've all had the opportunity to play with random case analysis uh, and use that with your teaching. Um, the, when, you, when you're playing around with flipped teaching, there's a few disadvantages potentially. Um, I don't see them as disadvantages. I probably see them as hiccups. Um, and Maggie, you're right, you're never too old to stop learning. And I think we're all good GPs. We're listening to the uh, RACGP. A uh, good GP never stops learning. As a supervisor, uh, it may require a little bit more organisation later on, uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, often you'll find that you may or may not need a teaching plan so that you can um, think ahead about how you can uh, give these resources to your registrar to go and search for a clinical problem or a, a knowledge issue that they may have. Um, that is where some of the GPSA learning guides come in so they can actually shorten um, and make that process easy for you. The problem with flipped teaching is if you've got a registrar that's not engaged, and we've all had those before, um, it can be really, really hard work. And if you've got a registrar who doesn't want to learn or wants a didactic teaching, um, doesn't want to learn or wants a didactic teaching, um, you'll be facing a little bit of an uphill battle. But hopefully you'll inspire them to be amazing. So all this is about flipped teaching. Teaching time is about application of knowledge. It is actually not for knowledge giving or knowledge sharing. It's a time where you can impart your wisdom, by all means. Um, but just think for an example, if you're doing all the talking and you've uh, got a registrar in front of you, I think of a registrar who maybe English is a second language for. Often they won't have the time or maybe the confidence, there may be some cultural issues 
they may not capture what you've had to say. So by allowing them to explore their own, uh, in their own space, uh, knowledge, then you'll find uh, teaching is going to be much, much more effective. And so that we do use an example. Um, so this is something uh, one of my registrars came with recently and I do, I won't apologise, I'm actually going to use um, my registrars as examples a few times. Um, so my, like most registrars, they all struggle with depression at some time. Uh, it's a really, really overwhelming topic. So they said that that's what they wanted to do next teaching session. So what we did um, before the next teaching session is they had some tasks to do. So one of the things is they often hit you up in the middle of a, a middle of a session. You know, it's difficult to do. So I gave them a couple of tasks to do, uh, depending on your learner. So one of them was something to read. So National Prescribing Service um, about depression, which is actually a really good summary. And I actually got them to watch a TED talk, just because it was fun, and asked them to pre-select a couple of question, a couple of patients who had depression. So that didn't take me very long. Um, probably took me about five minutes, if that, to do, because I had it there. So then what we did during our uh, teaching session, um, used random case analysis, which I am a big fan of, um, to use the patients that they'd already seen to explore um, depression and how they applied the knowledge that they had, they had got and then afterwards they can go on and do other tasks. So whether or not that be um, do the check on depression, for example. So what, what you're actually going to start seeing soon, and, I, and I'll actually go through some of the other guides that are now starting to come up. Uh, on the GPSA website shortly, uh, you'll start to see some um, teaching, teaching guides being put up. So this is the one on depression. Uh, and this is like something that you can pull off the shelf. So if you haven't prepared anything, you can just go, pull it down and um, pick what you need off it. So it might have a link to resources. Uh, it may have um, some information there on there that you can use with your registrar. So this is about making your life simpler. So there's about to become a whole suite of these. Um, these are ones that are currently um, being done. So as you can see, contraception, fatigue, they're all based on uh, beach and the top 30 presentations in Beach. You see, I told you we all want to make life easier and I'm a really, really lazy supervisor. So if I can have something that makes everything much easier for me, um, then I'm happy. And I can eat chocolate too. Okay, so just having a moment. Has anybody got any questions before we move on to the next bit? Yep. Wonderful. I love this slide. It's 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 just impressive. So, um, digital disruption. What does it mean? Um, I'm using it in the concept in the context of phone. Um, but isn't this fabulous that the world's largest taxi company doesn't have a taxi? Um, Airbnb, which is the largest accommodation provider, doesn't have any real estate. The largest telco in Skype doesn't have any infrastructure. The fastest growing banks don't have money. And, the, and Netflix, um, being the world's largest movie house, has no cinemas. So this, this turns everything that we've traditionally thought of what we should have and how we should do things on its head. So most of you, or you may or may not have, heard of Foam or FoamEd which is free open access and education. So this is just, um, it's an ethos and a concept and, and a movement about how we freely and openly share medical knowledge. Uh, nobody has the intellectual property rights to it. Uh, it is not to be brought, but it's just a way that we all share knowledge. And that's what di digital disruption is. And it's actually not that different. We've all grown up with it. It's not a new concept. Um, it's just maybe we're talking about it a little differently. 
So I certainly, when I was young, we certainly had a record player, and I'm sure there's many of you looking at the names on here um, that had a record player. Cassettes. I used to record um, our local radio station, and so, oh, Mickey, you're so pretty. I used to record the radios on the cassette all the time to play back. Imagine doing it now. CDs were revolutionary. Now they're considered old hat. Then came iPods. Didn't that, that, that was a game changer. That changed things completely. This is where we're now starting to move to. Now we actually don't own anything. Um, but we can download music and listen to it. Medical education is actually really, really slow on the uptake of digital disruption and about how we do things. Um, doctors, by definition, are very, very conservative. Uh, we're not quick to uptake new concepts. And, and I don't think this is actually anything terribly challenging. But if you have a look, um, but there is still value, Peter, in, in those good old vinyls. So our textbooks are still really, really important. But you know, the music and photography and the arts, they all took up digital digital changes very, very quickly. And as you can see um, here in 2015, medicine, education, healthcare, we're all just starting to come on board. And and things are about to fly and take off. So even if you're not familiar with the concept, it's really important to start knowing what it means. Actually, Maggie, that's right, retail has been very disruptive early on. And there's been lots and lots of change and it actually copes with change really well. Doctors don't cope with change very well at all. So thinking about knowledge and how we learn knowledge, um, this, is, this is a few years old now. Um, but this comes from Joe Lex, who's you know one one of the heroes behind the PhyMed movement. If you want to know how we practice medicine five years ago, read a textbook. So Murtar still has value in his textbook, and I still read it and look at it. If you want to know how we practice medicine two years ago, read a journal. If you want to know how we practice medicine now, go to a conference and you know ideally a good up to date conference. And if you want to know how we're going to practice medicine in the future, that's fine. And that is where your social media and um, those technologies that we use now come into play. So once upon a time, it was always that it was the people who delivered the education. So it was your medical educators, it was your lecturers, um, and, and that's all, um, and supervisors. And then we started, you know, and then you had your coffee shops and all those sorts of places where you sat and discussed things face to face. And that's still really, really important. So um, the new technologies don't replace that. All they do is they facilitate it. Then came the internet. And you think at how you would go if you couldn't open your web browser and look something up or Dr. Google at work. Um, you know, it would be really, really difficult. The next stage on from that is PhoneMed and using um, social media to, to have a dialogue, to have a conversation. And, and that's where what we're doing now. That's what this webinar is. And just having a look at that chat box uh, on the side and seeing the conversations that are happening. You know, and the last comment, so patients are often my best educators. They are. Um, it's about how we use the knowledge and how we share it. So I'm just going to run you through some of the um, tools that um, you can use to teach and where your registrars can go to find to find that knowledge. Um, and these are all part of Foam. These are all free and easily accessible. So obviously I have a bias. Um, and just for those of you again, sorry, GP's down under. Um, GPDU, uh, you know, we're now just over a couple of years old. It's a really, um, it's a Facebook site, um, so easy to access. Um, and we've now, oh, I think, nearly up to about 3,000 members. But it's a really great place um, for, for knowledge sharing. It's a place of peer support uh, and increasingly ad, you know, advocacy. So I'll go through a little bit later about how your registrars can go through 
um, or you can, um, to find answers to deficits you may have in your knowledge or just finding out um, where things are. This is an absolute favourite website. So this is Foam for GP. So this is an Australian website um, developed by Rob Park, um, Penny Wilson, Tim Willenberg, and forgive me if I've missed a couple of others in that as well, um, Marlena, Marlena Pitts. And Foam is a repository and a place to collate all this knowledge that we have. Um, anyone can go there, there's clinical categories, there's discussions, there's links, um, and anybody can contribute. This is the Australian site. Twitter. Some people are comfortable to tweet, some aren't. Um, I can see that there's some active Twitterers um, on site tonight. Um, we'd really like to get some of your feedback. So Twittering, um, play with it. All I can say. If you don't know how to do it, get someone to teach you. Who can do it. If you want to find something that's really, really up to date, um, or just to explore what's happening around the world, uh, Twitter is fabulous and useful. Really, really good tool in conferences as well. Um, so you can just have a dialogue and create a conversation. Genevieve, this one's for you. Um, these are blogs. So blogs are places of reflection and opinions about medical education and they're not they're places which are a little bit slower than Twitter or GPs down under. Uh, it's a place to reference as well. Does, Jen, did you want to say anything about the importance of blogs? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, and look, there's some really good ones around, and I've attached the links, um, and they they'll get emailed out later. Um, but when you've got time, I, they're a wonderful place to at least start your social media journey. So for those who want something a little bit more high powered, um, and the exciting place is this is now starting to happen uh, in general practice and primary care. Um, is SMAC is um, social media and critical care. Uh, and they really started this um, FIMED movement. There was all this knowledge happening in lots of different spaces. It wasn't being shared. And uh, really, it's just become an amazing, amazing space. And it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves in general practice over the next you know, five years. So does anybody have any questions or anything that they want to add before we go on about how we can use technology in a teaching session? Shall we move on? Okay, so this is using my registrar, shamedly again. Um, so my registrar had a clinical question. So I was really busy, I was in the middle of a teaching session, uh, sorry, clinical session and this is a great example of what happens when your registrar hits you up when you're really, really busy um, and teaching on the run and the tools that you can use. So she had a woman in with her. She was 24. Um, she had persistent bleeding on Implanon uh, and she couldn't take the contraceptive pill. She had a really quite a complex medical history and she knocked on my door and asked me for advice and said I was running 45 minutes behind or something awful. Um, and didn't have the time to actually sit down with her. And guess what? It's actually not my job to give her the knowledge, but my job to actually set her on her journey so she could go and seek it herself. So we decided to crowdsource. So she asked me, and then I probably didn't give her the answer that you know she was after at that time. She rang a gynaecologist, um, left a message with the receptionist um, for her to call back. Then what happened is she went on to GPs down under. So she put this question up. And as you can see, so Yoska doesn't mind me putting her name up. Um, so I've taken out the picture. And this is the question that she posed to a group. So instead of just having one supervisor to ask a question of, she now at this stage probably had almost 3,000 doctors that she could ask for advice. So this isn't pseudo-supervision, this is actually just going and asking um, 
your peers what they would do in this situation. So what an awesome re resource for a registrar. As you can see, she got some answers. And there were some links to some excellent clinical resources. So this is from PubMed. Um, there were lots of other links there as well. And here's the link to the study that came up. So you can see how my, you know, the registrar is now really starting to learn. I'm not doing any work and my registrar is going to come back to me. So she found, she found a podcast and she found a blog. Um, so this is Bits and Bumps. And she got some more information on that. So by the time we got um, to our teaching session, she would explored all of this. So what happened, going back really quickly, is by the time that the gynae rang back, by the time I actually saw my registrar again, because I actually had the day off the next day, um, she actually had all the answers to her session, to her clinical question. And what she did then is she um, got the patient back, dealt with the patient, She's learned a lot. I haven't had to do any work whatsoever. So I told you, I'm very, very lazy. We're almost about to finish up. Um, we've got five minutes to go. Um, I guess my message from today is that we're busy as supervisors. We have got so much that we have to do that we don't have to do all the work, we don't have to do all the talking, we don't have to teach in our room and our job is to inspire our registrars to be amazing creative thinkers and I hope that um, when you go into your next teaching session, I just want you to reflect a little bit on you know, who's doing the work, who's doing the talking, how can I do this a bit differently. So be bold, be brave, explore, um, dabble in social media, play with phone and more than that, have fun as a supervisor. So if you have any questions other than STI and pregnancy checks in the end, yes, I didn't put a complete history up, um, happy to hear from you. So we're just going to put a poll up, Marissa. Da -da -da. And just before you all head off, um, Look, Patrick, I don't like I don't like the name either, but it is what it is. And if we can come up with an amazing Australian name for it, um, that would be awesome. Um, but this is this is the the words that are being used in education, you know, whether it be you know in universities or primary school. So really, really appreciate your feedback. And also about how I can do things differently the next time it goes ahead. Thanks, Gudrun. Thanks, Brad.